for those of you that drive, if you had to pick your least favorite, we favorite weather to drive in, what would that be? Snow, ice, any other? Hurricane, that seems like a pretty bad one to drive in, yeah. Any other thoughts? Or are already pretty much in the snow and ice and hurricane lane? Just one of those lanes. What was that, Terry? Flood. Flood. That's another one. Yeah. What was it? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now, if there's a hierarchy of bad weather driving for me, I'd say torrential downpour is, is not fun, followed by dense fog, which is horrible, whiteout snowstorm or blizzard, followed by... Uh, instantly freezing rain and ice, that's almost the worst, and finally Sharknado. If you try to drive through a tornado of sharks, I, I think that would just be horrible. Um, if you don't know, there's a movie, or there's many movies called Sharknado. I wouldn't recommend watching them, so if you don't know about it, then kudos to you. But that would probably be the worst thing I could imagine driving through is a tornado of sharks. But a few years back, Jamie and I, we actually had a district meeting to go to down near Pekin or something, and I was, we were up in Freeport, and so Jamie said uh, we could drive his truck, but he wanted me to drive because I was familiar with the roads, which, well, anyway. So I set out driving his nice Ford F-150, and we left that kind of developed area of Freeport, Illinois, onto these country roads that drew us through sporadic farms, wooded areas, and just a lot of fields. And as we did, a dense morning fog settled down around us. It was the kind of fog where you couldn't see much more than maybe 50 or 75 feet. And although the GPS was giving me directions of which way to go, I couldn't rely on my eyes as much as normal. I mean, if you've been in that kind of situation, you know, like your eyes aren't a lot of help except for what's right in front of you. Now, to be honest with you, at one point, or really the whole drive, I was trying to go fast enough that we would not be late. I call that sanctified speeding. But I was trying to go this, a speed that would get us there on time while realizing that I can't really see anything except for maybe a brake light or a headlight when it got kind of close. But at one point, I was, I was attempting to go in this uh, sanctified speeding way. Um, and we were going through some hills, and I came I crested the hill. And right there, what we saw automatically, what the fog had been hiding the whole time, was a stop sign. I said, hold on. And I stopped on the brakes in this F-150 hoping that this nice big truck would stop in time, knowing that it probably wouldn't. Now, part of the truck stopped before the stop sign. That part that stopped before the stop sign was about the back wheel to the tailgate. Now, the rest of its truck and its passengers were past the stop sign into a road that did not have any stop sign at all. Now, fortunately for us, there were no other cars on the road coming in either direction. I tell you about that because, honestly, my, my eyes proved rather useless in that situation. And so I had to rely on more what I couldn't see, that I would trust that they would go as expected. I had to trust that the road would be unencumbered, that it would go on as I expected, that the drivers who were in the same situation, who were in this fog, would operate the same way, that they would stay in their lane and follow the, the laws of the world, uh, road. I had to expect that the drive, um, as I followed my GPS, on my phone that it would give us proper directions. And to be honest with you, I rely pretty heavily on GPS apps on my phone, uh, especially when traveling in areas I don't know. And that would include Rock Island because I'm still new here. And so when you try to give me directions, I appreciate you giving me street names and I promise I will learn them one day. But I sit there and nod because I appreciate the directions, but I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> but I'm learning, I, I know some of it now. But GPS, when you go to an area you're not familiar with, it not only tells me usually the fastest way, but it will recalculate and even redirect uh, based on when there's traffic that comes that maybe we wouldn't expect on a normal time. Now, without these apps, I'd have to rely on my knowledge of routes and largely personally shared driving directions. Now, I don't know about your ability and your sense of direction, to, and especially when people give you directions, but I prefer the navigation apps over knowledgeable spoken directions. The reason is because there are some people, they will give you great directions, and I might still have to write them down because if there's more than two turns, I'm not going to remember. But um, one reason, though, is because many times when people give you spoken directions, they'll reference landmarks that are no longer there. They'll require you to live as, where, where they have for as long as they have. They'll say things like, take a left at the old Standard Oil station. 
Well, Standard Oil hasn't been in business in how long? Long time, right? Or they'll say, go three blocks past where the old rusty nail was. Or, you know, it's in the old drawbridge restaurant off what used to be called Jones Byway or something like that. And you have no idea what they're talking about. I don't even know where the new thing is that they're talking about, let alone the old thing a lot of times. I like, or I prefer, directions that involve street signs. And even more so if there's a picture of what the road and the house or the, the place I'm going looks like. If I can see what I should be looking for, I'm a lot more comfortable going in that direction. But when my eyesight is kind of taken from me, when I'm going in blind, I, I don't like that very much. Now, I prefer to see things with my eyes, despite a history, now 45 years, of knowing that not everything I see is reality. Did you know that every February in Yosemite National Park in California, there is a phenomenal event where the horsetail, horsetail easy for me to see, say, horsetail falls becomes a lava fall. That's what it looks like every February. Now, do people go running for higher ground because there's lava coming over the side of this hill? No. It's simply the way that the setting sun catches the water, but our eyes would suggest that it's something else than water, wouldn't it? We've never seen water of that color. How many people, about 25 or 30 years ago, had one of these 3D print, uh, paintings or posters, maybe, yep, I see one hand, Two hands, a few hands, yeah, right? If you remember these, you had to stare into them. You had to kind of relax your eyes or whatever. And behind this design was a 3D image. It would be an animal or a scene or a car. Or I had one that had Yoda from Star Wars. But, you know, you would stare at it, and all of a sudden they'd pop. It was like it was just coming to view. Now, how about a couple years ago on, on Facebook, there was a white and gold striped dress. Some people said, oh, well, this is gold. Other people said, no, this is black. And, and so... Some saw different colors, blue and black, or white and gold. It depended on who you were and what you saw. Our eyes are often tricked, but it can be hard not to believe them because we have been groomed to think believing is seen, or seen as believing, depending on if you want to get backwards or forwards. In the Old Testament, there, there is a king named Ahaz who ruled over Judah, the southern kingdom of God's chosen people. He didn't really follow the God that his, follow, his, his fathers had followed, but he worshipped foreign gods and idols. Now, one day he learned something pretty upsetting to his life. We look to Isaiah chapter 2 for this, and we find King Ahaz, and he gets a message. Beginning in the second verse, here's what it says. The news had come to the royal court of Judah Syria is allied with Israel against us. So the hearts of the king and his people trembled with fear, like trees shaking in a storm. Now Judah was small and vulnerable. I mean, these two nations paired together could squash them like a bug. So much that we read that in what we see here. They trembled with fear like trees shaking in a storm. Have you ever been so scared that you've trembled like that? Have you ever had something in your life where it scared you so bad? My kids are in a thing right now where they want to scare me all the time, but they don't want me scaring them. But I said, it doesn't work like that. Like, if you're going to try to scare me, then I'm going to try to scare you. The hard part is my youngest, Evie, she'll get scared and then she'll start shaking. So I'll say, okay, I'm sorry. Like, let's, let's stop playing this game. <laughs> but that's so scared that you're shaking, you know. And here are these nations. There's this king and his men. They were trembling at the thought of these two nations coming against them. So then God sends his prophet Isaiah with a message for Ahaz in chapter 8. And here's what we read, flipping over to chapter 8, beginning in the 11th verse. I'll have it on the screen if you don't have it there with you. But the 11th verse, here's what God comes to the king and says through his prophet Isaiah. He says, the Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does, he said. Don't call everything a conspiracy like they do. And don't live in dread of what frightens them. May the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. He is the one you should fear. He is the one who should make you tremble. But he will keep you safe. So what's Isaiah's message? In the midst of what your eyes see, don't be afraid. 
Now, if you know the Bible at all, if you've been in church for any amount of time, or you've studied especially the Old Testament, but on throughout the entire story of Scripture, one of the, the repeated phrases from God is what? Do not what? Be afraid. More than the Ten Commandments, more than the other do nots, do not be afraid is one of the, and that's what the Lord gives me here. It says, don't call everything a conspiracy like they do, and don't live in dread of what frightens them, which is these armies that you see. He will keep you safe. Now the rest of that story is that the king was too afraid. He saw these armies coming against him. He ignored God, and he trusted what his eyes could see, which was this army. There was a large army against him. What he didn't need in that moment, he thought, he didn't need faith. He needed soldiers. He didn't need a word from a prophet. He needed heaven's armies to show up. He didn't want the God of heaven's armies. He wanted just heaven's armies to show up and help him. He needed more men. And so he, what he does is he actually goes to Assyria, another country, and he makes a deal with them. And he says, will you come and rescue us? And they say, sure we will. But they come and they take over his kingdom. Now they allow him to remain the king, but only in name. And he is now the subject of another nation. What's crazy in all of this is that King Ahaz, he wanted to keep the freedom of his nation. But he lost it by trusting his eyes instead of trusting God. And so he made his own plan and he lost out on the thing that he was trying to save. The call from God to Ahaz was to repent, to change only what we say we believe, but also to change the direction we are headed, to return to our Creator. Now this call, this call to repent, to turn from what believing just what you see and go in your own way and making your own decisions based on the information you have, is continued in through the life of Jesus Christ. And so we see that all throughout the Gospels, as well as season one of this series that we've been watching called The Chosen. Now this is our fourth week in that series, The Chosen, and we're exploring the call that Jesus places on his followers, both in our lives, but in the context of his disciples through the series and through the Bible. Now, this series has been supplemented by season one of the TV series, The Chosen, and I hope that that brings an enriched view of the events that we'll talk about each week. Now, episode four, which on Wednesday, if you watched it with us, or if you watched it at home, or even if you didn't, I'll just recap it for you. But episode four focuses on the story that takes place in Luke chapter five. So if you want to watch the show, I encourage you to do that. But more so, I encourage you to look into Luke chapter five, because that has the whole story. But in Luke chapter five, and in episode four of The Chosen, we have the calling of Simon. Now, in the episode of The Chosen, we find Simon, and he had made a deal he made a deal with the Romans to turn in Jewish fishermen who were fishing on Shabbat, or the Sabbath, and because he, he wanted to pay off his tax debts. He had a bunch of tax debt, so much so that he couldn't resolve the problem himself, so he made a deal that he would turn in other fishermen to pay for that. Now, what happens is that deal completely falls apart. He can't turn anybody in. And he still has this huge tax debt. And so he finally comes to his wife and he has like this moment of truth with her where he's like, I'm just going to lay it all out on the table. He says if he doesn't catch a ton of fish, he'll go to prison. They might lose their house or he may even be killed or his whole family might be killed. Now, there is a family crisis going on in the midst of all of this. His mother-in-law is very sick. But Simon can't be bothered with those details because he has to work and work and work to solve his problem. And so it's almost like he, can't even, he doesn't have time for that stuff. He's got to fix this tax debt issue. Now, in a, in a moment of marital debate, his wife asks, Where is your faith, Simon? And he says, Faith isn't going to get me more fish. And in that brief exchange, just imagine and produce on this television series... I think it's the rub of it all for many of us is that faith isn't for real problems. Some of us see faith is fine and dandy for church. It's fine and great for your morning devotions. Faith is great for what's going to happen after you die. We even ask people questions based on that, like where do you think you're going to go if you, if you die today, which is a fine question. I'm not railing against that, but what it does, it puts the focus on life after death, not life right now. 
And so a lot of us have gotten to the idea that faith only matters when it comes to spiritual things and that there's too many of our real problems we have to deal with and faith isn't going to help us. And so like Peter, we would say, faith isn't going to help me with more fish. Faith isn't going to help me pay my car note. Faith isn't going to help me with my relationship. And despite that, this, many of our prayers and our deepest wishes, it seems, are for God to fix the problems around us, just like Simon and his tax debt. And just like Israel and the rule of the Romans, their prayers to God were to take care of the problem they saw in their life. But Jesus didn't come to save the Jews from their political enslavement. Jesus came to save us all from our sin enslavement. Most of us don't see that as a solution, though. If you were to ask somebody, what are your five top problems in your life right now? Most people would not say, well, I'm, I'm a slave to sin. They would say, well, there's this person and they're, they're just really mean to me. And I really wish they would either go away or something. Then I have this and I don't have a really good job and I need a job. And those are real problems. So don't hear me say that those aren't important or are important to God. But a lot of times we think our everyday problems are our biggest problem. And so what most of us want is for God to come and deal with our problems, and we'd rather him do that rather than deal with our sin because we don't see that as a problem. But because of a sinful nature that we were born into, we have a predisposition to choose to go about life my way instead of God's way. And so that's the problem that Jesus came to fix. That's the issue that Jesus came to address. To live in a way contrary to the design of our very creator is the way that we are predisposed to live. And so it's natural for us not to want God to change our direction in life. Instead, we want him to remove the fog. We want him to level out the pavement. And we want him to bring the sunshine and the rainbows and the puppy dogs. Or kittens, whatever you prefer. That's another discussion. We want God to clear everything around us so that our way of going is better. But what Jesus came and did was bring his way, which is the best way. And so what he invites us to isn't that, oh, let me come come to me and I'll clear up all your problems. He's saying, come to me and I will deal with you and your predisposition to sin. Following God's lead, though, is so contrary to our our nature that we want to see what's coming. We want to know how many miles until we reach the destination. I just went to Ohio a couple weeks ago with my kids and and. Annalise, especially my oldest, she's almost 10, and the whole trip, she'll say, Dad, turn the map back on, because we have an a Apple Play, it'll show the map up there. I'll turn on some music, I'll change some music around, Dad, turn the map back on, I want to see how much longer we have. And it was a seven and a half hour trip, so I get that, but we were within 10 minutes, and she's like, Dad, turn the map back on. I'm like, it's 10 minutes. Okay, but yeah, but how long? Dad, we have eight minutes now. Okay. Let me turn the music down. Let me just, Dad, turn, can you turn the map back? We like to know how much long until we're going to get where we're going to go. We want to know it. We want to know things like that. We want to choose what's on the radio. We want to be in control. We want the credit when things go well. But when things go bad, when our choices kind of land us in a ditch, the proverbial ditch of life, a lot of times we blame God. Well, God must just hate me. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Well, I have, even if none of you have. Um, <laughs> So you'll meet people that will say, God hates me, I'm convinced of it. Why? Well, what happened? Well, this didn't work out, and this didn't work out, and this didn't work out. And it's like, well, did you ask him if you should go down that way? Well, no. But if God loved me, wouldn't he just make everything puppy dogs and rainbows? Or kittens? If you're deranged. Uh, I mean, you know, if you like kittens. But the idea of belonging to God, returning to the one who created us, even following Jesus, is wrapped up in the idea of changing directions. You, if you to follow Jesus, you have to guess what? Follow Jesus. You can't keep going to the, the beat of your own drummer and then be like, well, I'm following Jesus, because that's not Jesus, that's your drummer. And in large part, that is changing from relying on yourself to relying and stop relying on just what we see and what we understand and what we want to rely on what God sees, what God knows, and what God wants. This change isn't complicated to understand, really. We can say, okay, I understand that. But abruptly changing your life and the directions of how you're supposed to go, the change from being a selfaholic 
Because that's really what part of being a Christian is, it's a recovering self-aholic. It's abrupt. It's hard. You don't have a predisposition to that. And so it usually requires a seismic event in our life to wake us up that, man, we really don't know what's going on. And that's what happens to Simon in the Bible and in the series The Chosen. Now, Simon spends the night fishing because he has one night left to collect all the fish to pay his tax debt, and he spends the whole night out there. And if you've seen the series, you know he's out there, and he's pulling the net in, and it's empty. Pulling the net in, and it's empty. I imagine his desperation is increasing because the sunlight's coming up, and it's coming to the day, and he's caught zero fish, let alone the hundreds, if not thousands of fish he needs to pay off his debt. And so after all night on the water, he has nothing. Simon had tried, but he reached the end of what he could do, and he reached the end of himself. And so we see in this scene we're going to watch here in a minute, we see that Jesus asks him to throw his nets out again. He comes to shore, and there's Jesus, and Jesus says, throw your nets out again. I imagine that Simon, the experienced fisherman, has this stranger say, throw your nets out again. He's thinking, what does this carpenter know about fishing? Do you ever have that, like someone comes and offers you some advice or says, hey, why don't you try this? And you're like, who are you? Probably just me. Uh, but sometimes we have that, don't we? Maybe he even wanted to say to him, you know what, stay in your lane. Or don't quit your day job. I've been out here all night. I know everything there is to know about fishing. But what will Simon do? Will he respond to this thing that just seems ludicrous because he just spent the last 12 or so hours doing it? Or will he decide to follow that? Let's watch. Put that down for a catch. A little farther out. I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. At your word. Oh, it's a 
My brother and the baptizer. <laughs> you are the Lamb of God, yes? I am. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. You don't know who I am and the things I've done. Don't be afraid, Simon. I'm sorry. We, we've waited for you for so long. We believe, but my faith, how sorry. <laughs> Lift up your head, fisherman. <laughs> what do you want from me? Anything you ask, I will do. Follow me. When Simon stopped relying on himself, stopped relying only on what he knew and what he saw, when Simon came to the end of himself, he stepped up to the beginning of God. And God showed that while Simon was limited, God was unlimited. That while Simon knew what fit in this box and fit in his experience, fit through the lens of his world, of just kind of everything he had been through and everything he knew, God blew that out of the water through his son Jesus Christ and through these fish. And in that moment, Jesus calls Simon to follow him, to go where Jesus is going to go and do what Jesus does. And we read in, in Luke chapter 5, verse 10 and 11, it says, Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. For now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as, they had land, as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. They left everything and followed Jesus. That, that simple sentence there, they left everything and followed Jesus, demonstrates a drastic change in direction. They left everything. They left their tools. They left everything they knew, even who they knew. They left their old direction and their old life all to follow Jesus. Because Jesus wasn't there to save Simon from his tax debt, although we see in this that he did. He was ultimately there to save Simon from the power of sin and from death. And so when Simon saw no way out, Jesus broke in, made a new way, and changed Simon's life forever. But Jesus didn't force it on Simon. Simon could have told him, no way, Jose, or Jesus, or Jesus. He said, no way am I throwing this net over to the side. And then it's Simon who falls to the ground. And it was Simon who said, get away from me. Why? Because in that moment, he realized how going his own way made him unworthy. And he recognized how turned around and just out of place he actually was in life. And he said, man. But Jesus told him that familiar phrase of God that same thing he had told King Ahaz. Do not be afraid. In that moment, Jesus didn't rub Simon's nose in it, right? He didn't say, well, we're going to sit back and you're going to have to show me that you're serious. Jesus didn't give Simon a lecture. No, Jesus looked at this repentant, broken Simon and gave him new directions. And said, follow me. Simon left everything, making the choice to follow Jesus. This idea of a change in direction is also powerfully seen in the life of Mary in this series. When asked to explain to Nicodemus the Pharisee, Mary says, I was one way, and now I'm completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. This is the idea of the series that we're going through. 
is not only to highlight the choices that Jesus made in choosing his disciples, but also to highlight the choice those first disciples and even us have today in responding to the call of God. So let me ask you, when will you make the choice to let Jesus to lead you in a different direction? How many messages are you going to listen to? How many times are you going to come to the end of yourself before you're willing to trust God over what your eyes see? What will it take for you to be like Simon instead of King Ahaz? To make the choice to respond to God's call, to God's invitation, to repent, to change direction, and to follow Him. Is it going to take really bad circumstances for you to admit that you ended up in a ditch? Not because you have bad luck or or because God just doesn't like you, but because of the sin of going your own way. At the end of the day, I always remind us, I like to remind us that that sin at at its origination in the Garden of Eden was Adam and Eve deciding they wanted to decide for themselves what was wrong and what was right instead of allowing God to tell them what was wrong and what was right. And so that's what going your own way is, is saying, I'm going to go through life and decide what's right and what's wrong, and I hope that I make it, and that maybe the good will outweigh the bad. And a lot of people go through life that way, and they think when they get to heaven that there's going to be a scale, and God's going to measure it and say, well, you have three more good things than bad, so come on in. But if that's the way that it worked, then why did Jesus need to come and die? It's because he has invited us into joining our life with him to go his way. The way for which you were created, the purpose you were created for, the way that God created that he had in mind. Because as much as you think that you see, as much as you trust your eyes and your experience to get you through the fog of life, Jesus invites you to trust him and allow him to get you through the fog of life. The one who sees beyond the fog The one who loves you so much that he died for you. (coughs) And you might say, I didn't ask him to. But that's love. You didn't have to ask. He made the way even before you even thought that you might want to go a different way. And it opens you up to a relationship with God. The TV series is called The Chosen because it points to the people chosen by God to be his people. But because of Jesus, the idea of being his chosen people now applies to anyone who chooses to respond to Jesus' call to follow him. You don't have to be born into the right family. You don't have to be born in the right town or even the right part of town. You just have to be born again into the family of God through the forgiveness of sins applied to your life through repentance that says, I will follow Jesus. Repentance is a thorough change in mind from an old idea to a new idea and a thorough change in direction from going this way to a new way. Changing your mind that doesn't change your life, that's not repentance. That's just, oh, that's a good idea. But repentance is actually allowing your mind to be so changed that you change the way you live. A way that doesn't rely on what you see Or what others see. A way that doesn't rely on your ability to demonstrate that you're worthy. Instead, it's the way that's led by Jesus and what he knows. As you think about yesterday and as you think about this past week, this past month, or maybe even this past year, who's been leading you? What if right here and right now, We thought about what it might look like to follow God tomorrow in this coming week. What if we ask God to give us like his holy imagination to begin to understand what following him would look like each morning? From when we wake up, whether we hit snooze ten times, or we live with someone who hits snooze ten times and you want to whack them, or you just (laughs) get up. Whether you drink coffee or get donut or breakfast, some kind of breakfast. Your interactions with the people in your house, 
the person that you might text or call when you wake up, to when you step out for the day, what would it look like for someone filled with and following Jesus in those interactions? Would it look the same as someone who wasn't? I imagine not. For Simon, it dramatically changed from looking for prime fishing spots to looking and learning about the kingdom of God fishing spots. Learning to trust what God saw. Jesus made Simon into a fisher of men. What do you think Jesus wants to make you into? What collaboration is he inviting you into? What great things does he want to do through you? Not just in you, but through you. We won't know unless we trust his direction. I think, I don't know, I mean, I could be crazy and I probably am, but I think we should be excited about God's great ability to do far more than we can think or imagine. To do what seems impossible, to do something for someone that's unlimited, not in our box, not what fits in our nice thing. And even though it might not solve the problems around us, it does change us. Because a lot of times what we're asking God to do, and I talked about it earlier, is change the things around us. And God comes and changes us to go through the things we're in. And he says, not only that, but I'll go with you. And so I can't promise that your bank account will get filled with money if you start following Jesus. I pray that it does, and praise be to God if it does. I I can't promise that all of a sudden you'll have the perfect job, and all of a sudden there'll be sunshine and rainbows and puppy dogs or kittens, whatever the case may be. I can't promise that. But what I can promise is that you don't have to go through life being afraid because God goes with you, and He is ahead of you. He goes before you preparing the place. He goes with you as you go to the place, and he is with you through thick and for thin, and so whatever the case may be, he's not just there for the afterlife, he's for the now life, but he's here with you. And so I believe Jesus didn't come just to get you into heaven. He came to bring heaven into you through his Holy Spirit. And so you don't have to wait until you die to experience the presence of God in heaven. You can experience it today through him. Who wants to see what a limitless God with unlimited imagination can do in their life? I do, don't you? Let's stand and pray with